Hi, in this video I will explain to you what degrees of freedom are. First we'll take a quick tour to a place where degrees of freedom are very easy to understand and then we'll apply this to statistics. So what's the trick to making degrees of freedom easy to understand in statistics? We'll start with mechanics. In mechanics, the degrees of freedom tell us how many independent ways something can move. If we have a point and this point can move left and right, we have one degree of freedom. If this point can move up and down, we have a second degree of freedom. And if this point can also move back and forth, we have a third degree of freedom. So in total, we have three degrees of freedom. For example, a helicopter moving through space has three degrees of freedom, left and right, up and down, forward and back. Yes, it can also rotate, but we'll ignore rotation here. But what if we look at an elevator? An elevator just can move up and down because it's constrained by the shaft. Therefore, because it can just move up and down, it only has one degree of freedom. If we have two elevators, each one can move up or down. If we treat them as one system, we have two degrees of freedom. If we have three elevators, we have three degrees of freedom because each can move up or down. So let's take it a step further with a great example which brings us closer to what degrees of freedom are in statistics. As you may know, I'm from Austria, specifically from the beautiful town Graz. In Graz, we've got the so-called Schlossbergbahn, a funicular, think of a cable railway, that climbs the small mountain in the center of the town. And a fun fact, just over the hill, around six kilometers from the Schlossbergbahn, is the birthplace of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, but back to the topic. So in total, the Schlossbergbahn has two funicular cars. Like the two elevators, each can move up or down. But here's the key. The cars are linked by a cable. When one goes up, the other one goes down. So normally two independent cars would give the system two degrees of freedom, like two elevators. But the connecting cable is a constraint, so the system loses one degree of freedom. So we have the two cars and if one moves up, the other moves down. Now we're almost there. Imagine three cars connected by a single cable. Because the cable length is fixed, if the first car moves up by some distance, the combined downward movement of the second and third must equal that same distance. For example, the second car could move down exactly that amount while the third stays put, or they could split it between them in any proportion. But of course, we can also write this constraint mathematically. If we measure each car's height from the ground, the sum of their heights is constant. For example, h1 plus h2 plus h3 might always add up to 300 meters. Because one equation ties h1, h2 and h3 together, we lose one degree of freedom. With three variables and one constraint, we have three minus one, so we have two degrees of freedom. So in mechanics, you can literally see the constraint, the cable, and you can also write it as an equation. In statistics, on the other hand, it is difficult to imagine the constraints. But now that we've built the picture in mechanics, Let's carry it over to statistics. Okay, the question is, why do we have constraints at all in statistics? Well, in statistics, or more precisely in hypothesis testing, we are using a sample to make a statement about the whole population. And here is the key point. 
we use this sample twice. First, we use the sample to test our claim. Second, we use that same sample to estimate things like the mean. Hmm, what does that mean? Let's walk through a t-test together and see how degrees of freedom work. The t-test, more precisely the independent samples t-test, checks whether two groups, group A and group B, differ significantly. So first we need two samples. If we collect eight people in each group, we have eight independent data points in each group. But to test now whether these two samples differ, we use each group's mean. So we compute a mean for each group and to calculate it, we use the same data we're testing. And as we'll see shortly, these means are like the cable in our mechanical example. They tie the data points together and give us a constraint. If, for example, we have a sample of seven people and we calculate the mean from this data, only six of them can vary freely. So like in the mechanics example, if the cars are connected with a cable and we know the position of the first two cars, we automatically know the position of the last one. So in this case, we have two groups and we calculate the mean of both samples. We have two independent constraints and because of these two constraints, we lose two degrees of freedom. Therefore, in an independent samples t-test, the degrees of freedom are n1 plus n2 minus 2, where n1 and n2 are the sample sizes of the two groups and the two results because of the two means. Or if we have nine data points and want to fit a simple linear regression, we need to estimate two parameters, the slope and the intercept. That costs two degrees of freedom. Therefore, for a simple linear regression, the degrees of freedom are the number of data points minus two. So in statistics, degrees of freedom tell you how many pieces of information in your data are still free to vary after you've used some of them to estimate things, like the mean. But why do we need degrees of freedom? Statistics, we talk about degrees of freedom because our methods introduce constraints. We use the sample to test the claim and also to estimate quantities like means or variances. Each estimate uses up a degree of freedom and it limits how the data can vary independently. But why exactly do we need degrees of freedom? In hypothesis testing, we compute a p-value using a reference distribution, such as the t-distribution, chi-square distribution or f-distribution. And these distributions depend on the degrees of freedom. For example, this is the t-distribution for different degrees of freedom. If you use the wrong degrees of freedom, you get the wrong curve, the wrong p-value and possibly the wrong conclusion. Okay, but what exactly is the p-value? You can learn all about this in my next video. I'm Hannah and I'm looking forward to see you in the next one.